Welcome. Today we are going to talk about correlation and fossils, specifically index fossils. That's going to be the topic or title of our lesson. Woohoo! Our essential question for today is what is an index fossil and what do they tell us about Earth's history? Throughout this presentation, we will be talking about index fossils and how they help us correlate or match up rock layers from different areas to complete Earth's history. We apply the principles of relative dating to determine the geologic history of an area. So our principles of relative dating include those three laws that govern relative dating, the law of superposition, the law of original horizontality, and the law of cross-cutting relationships. Uh, and this allows us to determine the entire geologic history. We can match rocks or geologic events that occur at different locations all over the world at the same age. This is going to be called correlation. We're correlating the layers or matching them up based on their properties. Here's an example that's close to home. In this picture, we have national parks from five different areas around um, our area, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Our first is Grand, Na Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. Grand Canyon National Park is one of the best examples of superposition that we have. Uh, it really gives us a deeper look into Earth's history. In the Grand Canyon, we can st uh, look, if we look at the lowest layers, which would be the oldest based on the law of superposition, all the way back to the Precambrian period. So this is like the beginning of time. In Zion National Park, scientists have determined that these older rocks down here are not exposed. So they're buried deep underneath the ground. To correlate the layers, we are going to look at rock types that are similar. In this picture or graph, they have named all of the different rock layers that they found. So if we start at the Grand Canyon, we're going to match it up with something else that's already over here. So in our Grand Canyon, we have this Kaibab limestone. This Kaibab limestone matches up with Kaibab limestone that was found in Zion National Park. We can correlate those two layers or match them up in the rock record to extend our rock record so we get a greater idea of what was going on. Similarly, in Zion National Park, we have a rock layer that's called Wingate Sandstone. Our Wingate Sandstone correlates or matches up to layers in Canyonlands National Park, Utah, that extends our rock record. So we have Wingate Sandstone in Zion and the same Wingate Sandstone in Canyonlands National Park. Which two layers correlate between Canyonlands National Park and Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado? Right, we have this Somerville uh, FM and Somerville FM over here. Also, we have Entrada Sandstone and Entrada Sandstone, and our Curtis FM and our Curtis FM, and our Morrison FM and our Morrison FM. Similarly, to extend the rock record into the tertiary period, we have rock layers that correlate between Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado and Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. Which layers are correlating? Right, we would have Entrada Sandstone and our Curtis all correlating. Our Dakota Sandstone matches up, so we can extend the rock record. Here is another example using letters instead of names of rocks. We have two outcrops. An outcrop is um, like a sample that we're getting from a specific area. In order to correlate our layers, we always want to start with the oldest rock. Based on the law of superposition, our oldest rock will be on the bottom. For outcrop 1, we have Y, and for outcrop 2, we have O. 
we want to correlate or match up rock layers to get a complete look at Earth's history. So our layer O would correlate with layer O on this side. Notice here that there is a squiggly line between Z and O. This indicates a disconformity, which we learned about in the last lesson. What is a disconformity? This disconformity here is showing us that layers of the rock record have been eroded between outcrop 1 and outcrop 2. We are missing layers. We are missing layers M and N. So if we were to write these layers in order from oldest to youngest so far, it would be Y, O, M, N, Z. Then we have another disconformity above Z in outcrop 1. This means that layers have disappeared from the rock record. In order to see which layers have disappeared, we need to correlate our other layers. So Z correlates with layer Z over here. And we can figure out which layers have then disappeared. So we are missing layer S. And then we have T, U, Please finish the rest of this relative dating activity. Here is another example using four outcrops instead of two, so it's getting a little more complex. We want to start with our oldest rock, so we're going to start at the bottom, and we want to correlate to figure out which one of these is actually the oldest. So this U and U are going to match up. Currently, S out of these two columns is the oldest. We need to then look and see if we have anything else that can correlate. E correlates with layer E, which would make this outcrop match up with E up here and continue to extend as younger rock. If we look at this column, our AT here correlates with AT here. So this also would extend upward, making which letter our oldest rock layer? So S should be our oldest rock layer. And then we have U because of the law of superposition. In this section, we then have and disconformity, meaning layers have disappeared from the rock record. In order to figure out what layers those are, we need to correlate with our other layers and fill in the missing rock layers. This correlates, U correlates with U. So then our next oldest would be C, and then H. H correlates with H. But again, we have a disconformity. Please write the rock layers in from oldest to youngest. So now we're going to look at this using our actual rock names instead of just like the letters before. So the first thing we need to do is correlate our rock layers. I'm going to start at the bottom. We know that this layer correlates with this layer. This correlates with this. We have this layer, which is going to correlate with this layer, which would mean that our oldest layer is going to be granite. So our oldest layer here is granite. We'll make that gray. And then our next oldest is going to be this niece, which we've colored red. After niece, we have um, two different options. We have this basalt here, or we are going to have um, this conglomerate rock. So we need to correlate some more layers to figure out what is going to be next. 
So our conglomerate layers, I'm just going to shade in yellow here as they correlate or match up with one another. And our basalt, I'm going to use cayenne. We'll shade our basalt in with blue. So, so far, again, our oldest rock, we have this granite. And then we're going to have gneiss. And then it's a, a toss-up above our gneiss here. We have conglomerate. And above our gneiss here, we are going to have schist. So it will go conglomerate and then gneiss. And then we're going to have schist because this schist correlates with this schist. And then we'll have conglomerate. After our conglomerate rock, we can either have basalt or the sandstone. Since the sandstone is lower than the basalt in column two, our sandstone would be our next oldest layer. So again, so far we have our oldest layer as granite and then we have gneiss, and then we're going to have schist, and then we're going to have conglomerate, and then we're going to have sandstone. And then we need to correlate our next layer since we have this basalt here. Basalt would have to be our next layer because our sandstone is correlating. which layer would come after basalt. Right, after basalt, we're going to have limestone. And then our final layer on the top would be shale. Correlation of rock layers also often relies upon fossils because we have many uh, rock types that look the same and are the same. So there's a man named William Smith who lived in the late 1700s and he noticed that there were rock layers that were widely separated and they could be correlated or identified by their distinctive fossil contents. This led to the principle of fossil succession. Fossil succession is that fossils succeed each other or come after one another in a definite and determinable order and therefore any time period can be recognized by its fossil content. So in fossil succession it kind of ties into the theory of evolution that things have evolved and changed over time. So our oldest fossils are going to be the simplest fossils and as we continue on in time our fossils get more complex and have more complex features. This led us to index fossils. So an index fossil is any animal or plant that is characteristic of a particular span of geologic time or environment. In order for it to be characteristic of this geologic time, we need to make sure that it only has lived uh, for a short period of time, which means we're gonna have short vertical distribution and we'll talk about what that looks like in just a second, and that it lived over a widespread area. So basically our index fossils are going to give us a specific time, but will have lived all over the world and been very, very abundant, meaning there was many of them. If we look at um, this picture here, our time interval in our rock record is situated on the vertical axis. So an index fossil is going to be something that lived for a short amount of time, perhaps this green one, because its time is short, and it would need to be over a wide area. So if we took outcrops from lots of different areas, this green fossil might be in all of them. So short time and widespread. If we look at index fossils, here's one of our very most common index fossils. These are all over Colorado and New Mexico. This is a trilobite. A trilobite was a sea creature that lived on the sea floor, and they're very widespread and they only lived for a short amount of time, making it a great index fossil. 
These index fossils give us specific ages and allow us to better correlate, again correlation, our rock layers. So two or more things are related and we're going to reconstruct Earth's history from this. Here are some index fossils in these rock outcrops and we want to correlate our index fossils in order to match up the layers. So in correlating these events, we would have this index fossil in layer B correlating or matching up with this index fossil in layer D because they have the same index fossil. Likewise, we would have this trilobite in layer C correlating with the trilobite in layer F meaning that they are the same age. Based on correlation, put these layers in order from oldest to youngest. Here is another example of correlation via index fossils. We have three different outcrops and index fossils in all of them. Our index fossil A in A is a trilobite it would correlate with the index fossil down here in K, which again correlates with the index fossil in Q. Notice that K and Q are not the same type of rock. We do know that they are the same age though, or the same relative age, because they have this index fossil uh, located within it. Which other layers correlate based on index fossils alone? Layer H and layer M would be the same age based on our index fossils. In addition, layer E and layer N would be the same age based on index fossils. Which of these letters is the oldest possible layer? Which letter is the youngest possible layer? Here is another example of index fossils and correlation between two rock outcrops. Notice that we have a key in the top that tells us rock type, and then we have an area of contact metamorphism. So this is where lava has come out, and it touched the rock, and it changed it into a different type of rock like basalt. In these outcrops, we want to correlate rock similar rock layers based on their fossil type alone. Which layer does letter A correlate with? Which letter does layer C correlate with? Which letter does layer D correlate with? Notice that in layer C, we have it correlating with layer L. C is composed of limestone, and L is composed of sandstone. This is possible because these index fossils may have been widespread and probably lived in the ocean based on the seashell. Limestone is composed of dead organisms compressed together while sandstone is composed of sand pressed together. It is reasonable that the shell was buried quickly in each area and then turned into a fossil just made out of different rock. We kind of already talked about this picture before, but a lot of times when we correlate fossils, we'll see a timeline like this on our left-hand side going in intervals of up and down. So in this picture, these are the known times 
of when these index fossils lived. So if we find a compilation here, uh, let's look at this layer uh, right here. If we look at this layer right here, we know that the yellow fossil lived between this time and this time. We know that the blue fossil lived between this time and way up here. However, the yellow and the blue only overlap for this amount. So based on yellow and blue, we know that the fossil lived in this time range. In addition, we have found a pink fossil. The pink fossil begins at this time range, so we can assume that the fossil lived in this little bracket time here called A. So this rock layer is between this age and this age. Similarly, in this crop right here, we have a blue fossil and a pink fossil. Our pink fossil starts at this location, so we know that it had to have started here. However, our blue extends further. Since there is no pink fossils found during this time, we know that the this outcrop could not have started as early as this. It could have formed any time all the way up to when blue ends. So our, this outcrop would be from this time range. In this section, we're going to take a closer look at index fossils. Index fossils are used to determine the relative age of rocks. The best index fossils are of organisms that existed for a very brief time, but are found over a large or widespread area of Earth. In a sequence of rock layers, the index fossil would be found in many layers vertically, or, but would be widespread horizontally from one place to another. It is likely that a long time from now, humans will be an excellent index fossil. Human has existed for a relatively short time, yet our remains and signs of our existence can be found worldwide. The following represents the rock layers and fossils found at four widely separated areas of exposed rock layers. So each outcrop is from somewhere that is different in the world. Describe two characteristics of an index fossil. Which fossil is the best index fossil? The crab, the manatee, the twisty shell, or the flat shell? Explain why the flat shell is the best index fossil. Based on the types of fossils above, in what type of environment were the rocks deposited? In other words, what does it tell us about Earth's history? If we know that the flat-shelled fossil is 40 million years old, and the crab fossils were found in the fossil record between 50 million years ago and 10 million years ago, through absolute dating techniques like radiometric decay, which we'll talk about later, how old do you think that the manatee fossil might be? That completes our video notes for today. Please remember our essential question. What is an index fossil and what do they tell us about Earth's history?